I've worked at studios where we've been given the announcement that we've got a film awarded on a Friday, come in on a Monday to find out it's not awarded. Oh no. You know, I've seen I've seen I've heard stories where people entire teams are hired for a film, all relocated across the world to this location, and on the first day the film gets shelved. You're listening to Art Heroes Podcast, the show to help you thrive as a digital artist. Tune in to learn how to transform your passion into a career. Get inspired by other kick-ass 2D and 3D artists and find out what it takes to be an art hero. Hi guys, welcome to Art Heroes Podcast. My name is Marie JD, I'm your host as always. And I'm just about to start a meeting with Justin Holt. Justin is a texture artist and currently he's working on one of the most played video games of all times, Fortnite. But we're not going to only talk about Fortnite. We're going to touch a little bit on Justin's previous experience of over 15 years in visual effects industry, in different roles, in so many different studios. I'm sure Justin has loads to share. Let's go. Follow me. All right. Hi, Justin. And thank you so much for coming on the show. We're now live. Uh, Hello. 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 Okay, guys. So uh, we've got a quite um, tight agenda today. So we're just going to go right ahead. And uh, Justin, maybe we can start with you. So uh, uh, what do you do now? And uh, what are the recent changes that you've seen? And yeah, just in general, go ahead, introduce yourself. So for those who don't know me, my name is Justin Holt. I am currently a senior texture artist for Epic Games. I've been with Epic since the end of October. Before that, I'd spent about 15 years in the visual effects film industry, working in film and visual effects. Uh, and you know, with this current COVID-19 pandemic and, and the craziness that's, that's going on, it's been a very interesting transition for me, uh, going from one industry to another at a time where uh, the industry I'm leaving seems to be in, in a lot of uh, uncertainty right now. Yeah, this is crazy, right? Like very, very, very tight transition. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, before that, you've been in VFX, to my knowledge, around for around 15 years. Yes, yes. Cool. Uh, I started at uh, Rhythm and Hughes in LA back in 2006, 2005, 2006, and then went to uh, the Moving Picture Company in Vancouver, where I worked there for about a year, and then... Uh, got into one of my dream studios, Industrial Light and Magic. And I worked there for a few years and then hopped over to Digital Domain when they opened up a studio in San Francisco. Went there for less than a year and then joined with Image Engine in Vancouver for a few years, uh, onto Sony Imageworks in Vancouver for a few years, and then most recently Method Studios, uh, where I was there for a few years as well, and then uh, made the transition into gaming. Yeah, and I've seen that uh, um, you've worked on some pretty big titles uh, throughout your career, but uh, everywhere uh, it's been uh, texture and related roles. Yes, except my very, very first job was at Rhythm and Hughes as a lighting TD. <clears throat> so I was a lighting technical director for a film called Happy Feet back in the day. And I did that and very quickly realized that lighting was not my thing in terms of enjoyment. Uh, and then very quickly found my my interest in, in the texturing. Actually, I my interest in texturing started my first day of my apprenticeship as a lighting technical director, is that uh, we went in and there was this training room that we went into to train on the Linux platform and the tool sets at Rhythm. And we pulled up some look dev turntables of some character assets that were being done on Night of the Museum. And immediately when I saw those turntables, I was like, that's what I want to be doing. So uh, just very patiently did my time as a lighting TD, get my foot in the door, and then eventually transitioned into texture. Wow, interesting. Okay, so that's actually where I want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, 
talk to me a little bit more about texturing and why you love it and why you think it's, you know, it's the, the thing to do, at least for you. Oh, texturing for me, I really enjoy it because it's an imme immediate uh, satisfaction. You immediately see the work that you do come to life fairly quickly. Uh, I find that in visual effects, and I guess it's in gaming as well, every single discipline that, that exists within each industry has very specific people who have very specific dispositions for what they do. So, for example, someone who's an animator, if you've known a lot of animators, you tend to see that they have this way about them uh, that there's a, sim a similarity between the people and personalities that do animation versus the people and personalities that do rigging or effects or modeling, texturing. For me, it's always been about the immediate response of pen to paper, uh, ink to paper, paint to paper. And to me, that was what I really loved is you could take essentially a clay sculpture that's digitally created and bring it to life through texture and materials and the way it reacts to lighting. It's always been just super fulfilling for me. Wow, interesting. So did you actually study that or like your knowledge is mostly all like from experience and is it like? I did study it. However, I was kind of a late bloomer. Uh, my first, I only spent two years at an art school, Hispanic College of Art and Design in Georgia. Uh, but before that, I had no plan or interest in doing anything artistic related. I was uh, on the track of medicine. I was pre-med at my previous college because uh, one of my brothers is a doctor and I thought that's something I wanted to pursue. But when I fell into the art, and I'd always done art but just kind of as a hobby, but when I started taking it seriously as something I wanted to do professionally, that's when it kind of all came together and I gained a certain level of clarity in terms of what I want to do and where I want to go. All right. So um, basically, when you transitioned from lighting to texturing, um, how difficult was that in terms of additional skills that you had to get or that was? It was, it was, I mean, if I had to be really honest, it was kind of a seamless transition for me. There were definitely things I had to learn in the moment on, on the job that was kind of the nature of it because I had studied it at SCAD, uh, but only to the level that you would study anything really in an art school. Uh, I actually looked at my very first demo reel I did way back when, and it's, it's pretty terrible compared to the, some of the stuff that's coming out these days. Okay, don't like, tell me. <laughs> really, really terrible. So uh, it was just a different time back then, but a lot of stuff I did learn on the job, but I, it came very naturally to me, just the process and, and and everything that you do within texture painting. Um, so that's also one of the indications I, I felt was uh, a sign in the right direction for me. Yeah, right. And I think it's quite interesting that you said that uh, like every uh, type of artist is different. So what are texturing people like? Like how do you identify another like texturing artist when you see them in, on the, in the festival or in the studio? I would say, generally speaking, texture artists well it depends where you work because certain studios have <clears throat> texture artists that are separate uh disciplines compartmentalized compartmentalized disciplines whereas you have other studios that texture artists also do one or two other things however generally speaking i find that a lot of people that do texture painting are the uh, the people that enjoy painting the people that enjoy um <clears throat> drawing sketching stuff like that uh, that kind of medium lends itself to, to what you do in texturing digitally. Okay. And uh, um, do you like, do you paint actually, or do you sculpt like so for yourself? For me, uh, I've been so busy in my career that it's been difficult to do that kind of personal work. Uh, any personal work. And I, also I, I'm, I'm a father of a four year old. So that, that has its own um, challenges in terms of uh, free time. 100% understand that. <laughs> yeah, so, so for me, a lot of the personal work I've done up until very recently was digital. So, you know, collaborating with friends and other people to do uh, different characters and things uh, in my own time. Uh, but for me, <clears throat> in terms of traditional mediums, 
really the thing that I enjoyed doing the most was just graphite sketching. Uh, I did do painting, I did do, uh, you know, um, watercolor painting, stuff like that. But most of it for me in terms of enjoyment was just pencil to paper. Wow. Okay. There are so many things I want to touch on, but okay, let's stick yeah. to my, <laughs> let's stick to my agenda. All right, cool. Then, um, I wanted to, um, like dive a little bit in, uh, texturing, but, uh, VFX where you yeah. kind of come from. So, um, to start with, uh, do you see there, are, um, major, let's say, uh, differences in between, uh, working as a texturing artist in VFX and gaming industry or is it pretty much the same it is the same but it's different there's a lot of things that cross over <clears throat> in terms of methodology technique however the technology in both industries couldn't be any more different they're kind of converging at this point you know with with the with the introduction of real time rendering but uh, there are a lot of differences in terms of back-end process. So in the beginning when you're painting, I mean, you use one of two programs these days, it's either Substance Painter or Mari, uh, which in essence are basically the same thing in terms of laying down textures. They're done very differently, but essentially they, they, do, they both do the same thing. <clears throat> one is more PBR uh, based, whereas Mari is kind of moving in that direction, but it is very different, whereas Substance Painter is much more PBR based. Uh, but ultimately, it's the same process. It's putting down values and, and, and information that drive shader qualities in a shader, basically. So in, in terms of texturing, it's similar. But in terms of how you get that to a final product is very, very different. Okay, but then, you know, we're talking pipelines and that obviously has to be different. So that's yes, yes, no exactly. question. Yeah, yeah, no question to that. Yeah. Okay, and what is it like in in general working on big titles? How much liberty do you have as a, a texture artist? And uh, to what extent, uh, like what what kind of guidelines do you get at all as an artist? Well, I would say for all intent and purposes, I would be considered as a quote unquote commercial artist. And whenever you use the term commercial artist, there is a certain understanding there. I am not, when I'm working 24, uh, 40 hours a week at my day job, when I'm working at my day job, it's not my art. It's the yeah. art that's being commissioned or being paid for by a studio. So with that regard, there isn't a whole ton of artistic licensing or liberties you can do uh, because ultimately you're, you're trying to fulfill the, the vision of someone or, or some, a group. Of people. Mm -hmm. So with that regard, you do get a lot of direction, very clear, concise direction in terms of what you want in film. Uh, there are occasions where you, because of schedules, because of the craziness that happens in the industry, they don't get time to do concepts. So you do have occasionally opportunities to develop uh, a character, develop a material uh, in conjunction with certain supervisors within your studio. And then it also depends on your supervisors on that film. Uh, some mm -hmm. give a lot of liberty, less micromanaging, and they allow artists to do their thing because that's what they're paid to do. Whereas other supervisors are a little bit more, uh, you know, play close to the chest. So a lot of things you can't riff as much uh, on on those shows, on those films with those supervisors. But ultimately, it continually as every step goes it continually gets funneled down and focused into a very specific vision okay yeah thank you for saying that i think the notion of commercial artists is very important specifically to uh folks out there who are just starting in the industry yes yes that's one thing i i try to stress when i was mentoring students at think tank training center in north vancouver uh is that you have to understand that this is not your artwork so if you are given a request to do something that you personally disagree with. It's not your place to disagree with it. Uh, for the most part, uh, there are very specific scenarios where you can kind of push the boundaries and limitations. But ultimately, if someone wants it to look pink and you think it should look green, you just got to make it look pink. And I've seen specifically in texture painting where you come from the background of these people are fine art 
where they sometimes they have a very difficult time letting go of that uh, because they do view it as their artwork. So when they have someone that is in direct conflict or the vision they have internally, I, I see people struggle with that sometimes. So whenever I can with students, I try to remind them and have them try to be as mindful as possible that all, at the end of the day, you're being paid to do this to fulfill someone else's vision. So that's what you're supposed to be doing. Oh, yes, 100%. And then, yeah. well, as an artist, you always have your free time to do whatever you want with your art. Yeah, exactly. Something has exactly. to pay the bills. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then talking about um, schedules and uh, time frame, um, is there like a standard uh, time that you would be working with a character? So talking about VFX. In film, that is entirely dependent on the studio that you work at. So some studios, to be quite honest, schedule no time to do anything. So it's pretty crazy all around. Everything was, needs to be done yesterday. Whereas other studios, and it's a vicious cycle. You know, it's a tough cycle to break out of because there's a lot of moving pieces. And uh, to try to explain that in a single conversation is, is pretty difficult. But in film, just like in any kind of artistic endeavor, when you have a lot of moving pieces, it's, it's a house of cards. You know, if you take out one card, it takes out a whole section and then you're trying to, and it's also a moving target. So there's a lot of variables that make it very difficult to uh, keep things consistent. However, you do have other studios that uh, have found their process, have built an infrastructure internally that works quite well for them. It allows them to churn out work uh, at, a, at a rapid pace, but also uh, removing a lot of the technical difficulties and, and, mild, and, and hurdles that you experience in studios that don't have good pipelines. And so artists can focus more on the art rather than the technical side. So in those studios, they do schedule out quite a bit of time for specific assets, characters, props, costumes, stuff like that, uh, because they have it down to a very concise science. Uh, so it really depends what studio you work at. So for a character, for a hero character that has speaking dialogue and emotes, uh, the range is anywhere from one week to do the entire textures from start to finish to six months and it really depends on the studio so wow okay yeah that is that is very different very very different and i've worked at both ends of the spectrum in film whereas uh one end i have it's almost like they're just realizing they're getting it and so <laughs> it's like oh okay i gotta get this done right now other studios are you have conversations and meetings about a character before anything starts so it really depends on the studio. Okay, interesting. So uh, do you think it's possible to describe like a typical uh, project um, you would get working in VFX? Just like, you know, something really standard. Say you're hired for a title, like what do you expect uh, like to be doing? And are you there actually for the whole like production or you only come for the specific, uh, let's say certain number of weeks or months? Yeah, so... Textures? My role in film for the last, it must have been like the last eight or nine years was in a supervisory capacity. So uh, with that, less time on the box, more man managing teams, uh, productions, uh, kind of the overall quality control on work for a studio. So again, this also depends on the studio you work at. Some studios, the studios have, um, internal visions of what they want to produce and where they want to go. Again, some studios have this vision, others don't. It's a huge spectrum. But ultimately, every studio wants to find something they want to stamp as theirs. Uh, for instance, Digital Domain is trying to take over the digital human space uh, and uh, photorealistic characters that, you know, obviously Weta does very well. Uh, so every studio has their reputation. Uh, MPC has a great reputation for photorealistic environments. Uh, so depending on that studio, you're going to see more of that type of work come in. So some studios, if you do work at Digital Domain or Weta Digital, chances are you're going to be getting projects that have character work, that have uh, pushing the edge, kind of a cutting edge bound, uh, on the boundary of what's possible in terms of photorealistic performances and characters. Whereas MPC, they do obviously a huge amount of work and they can do the whole range from characters to creatures to environments so you see them taking on kind of a bit of everything but large chunks 
I think MPC at any given time, back in the time when everything was working and we didn't have this COVID-19 pandemic, they were working on anything from like 12 to 18 films at once, which cool. is like mind blowing, whereas some studios only take on two or three. So they, they had a system in place that allowed them to turn on a lot of work. So again, it depends on the studio that you're at uh, with regards to the type of work that you get. Yeah. Um, but if I were to be very specific, so for instance, my last job at Method Studios, they were, at the time I was there, their goal was to take on uh, creature character work, but also environments, which it's difficult um, unless you have proper infrastructure for that because both are so drastically different in terms of development and tools. Uh, and you have to sink a lot of R&D into both in order to get to a place where you can produce a mass amount of it at a quality that, that matches competitors. Um, but most recently, you'd see a lot of variable in terms of uh, variation in terms of work that they receive. Uh, whereas one show is very character creature heavy, whereas another show is just environments. So yeah. that way they can they can divvy up the employees, the the teams, and schedule them accordingly. So you're not doing things concurrently. Interesting. So, and a supervisor, as a supervisor, as a as a manager, um, would you typically be working with one title specifically, or with the studio and kind of a supervising like uh, a number of different projects, or there will so be also different? Yes. Yeah, so, so a method I was responsible for all the text work going through the all, the studio at, at all times. Oh, okay. So I was managing anywhere from two to eight. I think at the height I was managing nine films at once. Oh uh, my god. Yeah, and three of those were Marvel films at the same time, and Marvel films can get pretty crazy. So uh, at that capacity, I'm working with productions, making sure everybody has what they need to a degree. You can't please everybody all the time. So making sure that uh, deadlines are being met, making sure that work is looking good coming out of the tech department, liaisoning with modeling department, with the look dev department, with lighting, with rigging, uh, just to make sure that everything's working accordingly. And if anything isn't working, then it comes to me. I also make sure that I have a, a, a delegation of leads <clears throat> on each show. So I'm not literally putting up fires on every show all the time, whereas leads are doing that. And if they have an issue and they can't figure it, then they come bump it up to me and then I look at it as well. Uh, on top of that, I'm also recruiting and also scheduling bidding work for each film and films that are coming in that we're expecting to come in. So it was kind of like a, every day was different and every day had its, its uh, That sounds challenge. insane. That sounds yeah. insane. Yeah. And so um, junior texture artists or let's say uh, mid range, um, they would be coming uh, in like, in case of VFX, they would be coming per project or um, do you see the trend of employing people more of a full time? So my personal opinion is that you can't have a team. So if I were to specifically just focus on the texture department, uh, because at the very end at Method, I was also in charge of modeling and look, develop look development. So I was in charge of three departments. But for just for texturing specifically, uh, I'm a firm believer that you have to have a, a balanced ecosystem. You can't have a team of all juniors. You can't have a team of all seniors. And you can't have a team of all mid-range people. You have to have a balanced ecosystem. So uh, no matter what type of work comes in, you can facilitate that and keep everybody happy. But more importantly, keep everybody moving forward, keeping everybody progressing in their personal careers. <clears throat> that was also a tricky thing as a supervisor is on top of everything that I just mentioned, I'm also responsible for making sure that people feel like they're getting to where they want to go. Because if they don't feel that, then they leave. And it's a very important to keep retention uh, of artists, especially good artists. And there's a range of juniors, mids, and seniors in terms of uh, there's a junior, like entry level junior, but then there's also really strong juniors, what I would personally call rock star juniors, where they're still a junior because they're new to the industry, but they're doing work that easily could be a mid-level artist. And then the same goes for mid-level artists. There's some rock star mid-level artists that are taking on senior level work. So with a balanced ecosystem, you can spread out all the roles and responsibilities of texture tasks uh, easily. Whereas if you had a team of all seniors, guess what? You're going to have to try to satisfy an entire team of seniors, which is impossible. 
because there will ultimately be busy work and grunt work that needs to be done. So either I take it on myself personally because I don't want to burden a senior with it and risk them leaving, or uh, you have to ask a senior to do it and explain to them that this is only temporary. We're getting you onto something interesting next time. So it, it's a balancing act and trying to find that Goldilocks area is very challenging. I love that. And I, I, I absolutely agree with you that team dynamics is very important. And it's not only about like delivering the project. It's actually about like also thinking in the future. I think yes. it works across industries. So um, uh, one question here, who are the rockstar juniors and what actually makes them rockstar? Is it the famous 10K hours or why do you think they're different? Like the prodigies? <laughs> um. It's a good question. I think the way I, I've explained it in the past is that there are, I think, okay, the easiest way for me to do it is, is related to something that I had a strong passion for growing up. I was uh, obsessed with basketball. I played basketball 24-7 growing up. So if I were to use basketball as an analogy, there are basketball players and then there are the greats, you know, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. You have people that can play basketball. They do it proficiently. They do it well. They get the job done. But then you have other people that do it with what I call flair. And it's the flair that you can't teach. You can't. It's, it's just something that people possess. They either have it or they don't. Uh, and it's those people with the flair uh, that I've noticed even in school when they're still in school studying uh, that I know for a fact, oh, these guys will be fine. They're going to go on to very successful careers because they have an ability to uh, elevate the work to a level that, again, it's difficult to teach. Uh, you can give someone step-by-step -step instructions, and I have, on how to do something. Uh, and you give those same instructions to two different people, one person with flair, one person without. The person without will do it well, and it looks good. But the person with flair does it in a way that elicits an emotional response, just like any good artwork. You see it, and you're like, wow, that's really like you kind of have to look at it for a second. You're like, yeah, that's really good. It like that it surprises you. Um, and to me, that's the difference between a rock star junior and a and a a proficient junior is that the person has an understanding on how to take it to a level that is beyond polished. It starts entering the world of of intrigue. Like people start asking questions when they start looking at it, or they start relating it back to things they know. Um, and that's what the great texture artists that I've worked with can do is they, they, it stops becoming texture work and it starts becoming a story. And that's, that's the difference to me. Interesting. I absolutely love that, how you linked it with a story because I absolutely agree that, uh, there is a story behind every character and texture is, uh, probably one of those things that actually creates the story, you know, it gives this, the feeling and yeah. emotion behind it. Look development does and modeling does in terms of asset work. But uh, a lot of it, I mean, it's all intertwined, right? So yeah. you can't have good textures yeah, without on the really good character. Models. Yeah, and you can't have good look dev without good textures. So it's kind of all connected. 100%. But there is a story behind every aspect. And when it's lacking, like yep. you, kind of, you kind of feel it. Absolutely. Even Absolutely. as a consumer, as in, you know. Consumer yeah, and, and these days, consumers and audiences, they're much more savvy than they were even 10 years ago in terms of what is photorealistic and what is believable and what isn't uh, because the boundaries are being pushed on a consistent basis. So uh, it's, a, it's an ever-evolving challenge to continually try to entertain and, and bedazzle audiences with visuals that take them out of reality and, and and immerse them into these fantasies, into these stories, and these, these world stories. We'll go back to this in a second, but before I forget, like one last thing that I wanted to ask about uh, the uh, VFX industry um, is the notion that it has really pretty bad reputation for short projects. And that mm -hmm. at certain times, artists join a project and probably it's like really well paid because but then the project is over and you're by yourself again. So um, do you agree that it is still true or that's maybe something from like five years ago and not longer valid? 
No, no, no. It, it's it's a volatile industry. I, I'm not going to sugarcoat that because of the nature of the schedules, the ebbs and flows of the industry. You'll see a lot of feast or famine uh, scenarios in a given calendar year. So summers are typically slow, winters are typically slow in terms of work, but then in the falls and the springs, it's it's abundance. So with that nature, uh, and with the fact that you know um, margins in visual effects are maybe one percent, there are no margins in visual effects. So operating as lean as possible is the only way to survive for most of these studios. So with all of that, yes, it's volatile. You will get contracted for a specific project, but because studios don't have crystal balls and they don't know really if the next project will land until they're actually working on it, it's tough to say. Uh, I've worked at studios where we've been given the announcement that we've got a film awarded on a Friday, come in on a Monday to find out it's not awarded. Oh no! You know, I've seen, I've seen, I've heard stories where people, entire teams, are hired for a film, all relocated across the world to this location, and on the first day, the film gets shelved. So, it's just the nature of the business. Because of that, I make it a strong point to when I interact with students and talk to students, uh, to explain to them the nature of this business. Also, explain to them that your goal is yes. If your goal is to work in film, yes, you need to work at these big studios uh, and if, if that's what you want to do. But you always have to look out for yourself at the end of the day because studios will do that to a certain degree, some better than most. But ultimately, when push comes to shove, it's business. So you need to be mindful of that and build a personal um, identity outside of where you work. And that's something that I learned early on in my career working at Industrial Light and Magic, uh, seeing all these just rock star artists. I got starstruck just meeting some of them like because I knew what they worked on. Uh, but seeing them pursue art outside of where they work and build a brand uh, for who they are outside of where they work. So it's not the, it's not, oh, uh, Geonockville works at ILM, it's ILM has Geonockville. And there's a big distinction. It's, there's a distinction in that mindset. And it's because people like Geo, people um, like you know Chris Costa, these people promote themselves outside of the studio that they work at and build a brand. And that brand is what carries these people through and, and provides them more opportunities and uh, propels them in their careers. Whereas if you just put your head down and work, and don't update your reel, don't have a, a presence in, in the community, the online CG community. If that studio goes belly up, what do you have? Who, who do you know, right? It, it's yeah. your reputation that ends up carrying you through your career. Uh, and so that's something that I stress very importantly that your demo reel will get you in the door, but it's your, your reputation that will keep you there because nobody cares about the work uh, at a certain point. So yeah, thank you for saying that. I think this is really important. And so, is there anything else that artists uh, uh, should do or are doing to kind of protect themselves from all these like ups and downs and volatility in the industry, or it's pretty much just the reputation and uh, and getting to um, know people? To me, the other thing I tell students is there's always room for the best. So as long as you're pursuing that, uh, and and you if you if you use that as a mentality. There's always room for you there, no matter how bad you know it gets. Uh, obviously, the COVID-19 scenario has thrown everything up in the air. But uh, like I said, most studios want to keep a balanced ecosystem. So there is room for junior level people. There's a misconception where juniors feel like, oh, there's no room for me here. Uh, I'm not going to try. Every studio is looking for a solid junior artist. Most studios, most departments, a solid junior artist is worth its weight in gold because you can give that junior artist things that you can't give a mid or a senior. And if they're really good at it, I mean, it, it, it's, a massive, uh, uh, it's a massive asset to that team. Uh, so you don't have to burden seniors with this type of work. And you give juniors opportunities to gain more experience and do more things. So there's always room for every, dis every level within a discipline. Um, and all you need to do is focus on being the best at what you can do. Because if you can do that, uh, 
they're going to want to keep you because your value is there and the value of, of what you contribute is there. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. Amazing. I think this is super, uh, super inspiring. I think it's a great tip as well. Uh, like a little exercise. When was the last time you updated your portfolio? Uh, now let's be honest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> actually, if, if, yeah, I, I actually, I updated it a couple weeks ago. Oh no. Uh, yeah. So with, <laughs> with COVID-19 hashtag. No, 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 no. With Fortnite, uh, with the work that I do, uh, because Fortnite's not a not a game in a traditional sense, where most games have a delivery date and the game's done. Whereas Fortnite's a, it's a product, and we're releasing consistently, always, seemingly forever, because Fortnite is this massive thing. So with that, the the work that I do, I get to see go in the game much faster than I would in film. In film, it would take me six months, maybe a year, sometimes two years before I see my work that I started actually realized and then it would be another six months before i see um it'd be another six months before i actually get to use that work so for me in gaming the turnaround is much faster so what i like to do is like i said before keeping your stuff relevant uh, i like to update my portfolio on art station i like to update my website with the work that i'm doing uh and so yeah technically i updated it like last week I had yeah, I've seen the three, the three characters. I think there are three, right, on your website? Yeah, there are three that have been posted, yeah. Okay, cool. And that finally brings us to the Fortnite and, uh, and your recent change. So um, before we go into details, tell me a little bit why you actually decided to go from VFX to gaming, because that's uh, kind of the opposite of what most people do. Yeah, so if you were to ask me, if you would have asked me in September of last year if I would ever consider going to gaming, I would have laughed at you and like, no. <laughs> because I love what I do. I love working in film. I love working in movies. Movies are a great passion of mine. I love film. I love the medium. I love the storytelling. Not that gaming doesn't have great storytelling, but that's what I knew for 15 years. We can talk about that so, later. <laughs> yeah, so... For me, I had no interest, but I saw writing on the wall. I saw schedules getting crazier in film production. I saw studios scrambling more, uh, both internally and externally. And the already volatile nature of the industry, I just personally, I saw it. I didn't see an end in sight. It just seemed like it was just going to get worse and worse in terms of craziness and and uh, just the unknown. Like, like I said before, you don't know you have a project until you're actually working on it. And there were some projects where we were working on and we still didn't even really know if we had it because there there everything wasn't signed yet. So with that nature of it, I was like, you know, being a father, you know, responsibilities, I started thinking about gaming. To be honest, I had considered gaming many years before, but at the time, uh, what I do wasn't really a thing uh, in terms of dedicated texture artist. That was, it really was non-existent in, in game work. In game work, you did the modeling, texturing, and the quote unquote look development. So they didn't have spots for people that just textured. Fast forward five, six years later, those roles are starting to emerge because of the convergence of film and, and gaming. So with all that in mind, um, I had a random conversation with a buddy of mine that I went to college with. He coincidentally works at Epic Games. Uh, I worked with him at Industrial Light and Magic. And ever since he joined Epic, he joined a while ago, he was just raving about it, everything about it, and raving about gaming and real-time rendering. And so it was just kind of this perfect moment where it just I had an epiphany. And I felt this intense need to pursue this seriously because before it was very casual. You know, I, I had several interviews with gaming studios, but I didn't take it entirely seriously, if I had to be honest, just because I never imagined myself working games because I don't really play video games, right? I did when I was a kid, but it, I wouldn't call myself a gamer. So uh, from that conversation with my friend, I, I reached out to another person I, I knew at Epic and they got me in touch with recruiters and then started the conversation. And then it just kind of 
organically evolved into serious conversations and a serious interview process and a serious test that I had to do. Uh, and I started slowly evolving my mentality to the point where towards the end of the interview process, all I was thinking about was I have to get, I have to work at Epic. Wow. I, ha I have to work here because everybody that I've talked to, everything that I've seen, this is it. This is the company that is 10, 10 steps ahead. Uh, whereas in film work, you're always playing catch up. You're always trying to, trying to get ahead of the curve, but just not quite. Whereas Epic, they're, they're like, they're playing a different sport at this point in terms of where they're going. And to me, that is the key. And I had that epiphany because, you know, in film, there are very few studios that are truly innovating. In my opinion, there are only two studios right now truly innovating, and that would be Digital Domain and Weta Digital. Uh, MPC has done some really interesting advancements in visual effects, but Didi and Weta are, are stepping outside of the box and trying to think of it beyond just film and thinking about you know, what visual effects means as a, as a medium in general. And that's pushing boundaries, whereas Epic is doing that thing. And I knew I'm not going to be working at DD, and I'm not going to be working at Weta. So I had this epiphany that if I'm not working in those two studios, I don't feel, I feel like my time in visual effects has come to a close, and I need to pursue something different. Uh, and that's when I focused all my energy in trying to get into Epic. So I was beyond excited. Uh, to get in. The last time I felt this excited was when I got the acceptance from ILM. And then before that, I got the acceptance of Weta Digital, uh, which I didn't end up going for other reasons. But uh, yeah, extremely happy with the transition. Amazing. So, well, congrats then. I mean, it's a late congrats, but still. Um, so uh, I, I love how you mentioned that uh, um, Epic are really innovative. I can't agree more about that. But uh, do you think it has something to do with the uh, consumer expectations and with what you mentioned before with like wanting to see more believable stuff out there also in video games is it this direction no because no, uh fortnite has a very specific art artistic direction and that that direction evolves i mean if you look at season one versus the current season obviously very different aesthetically but there is that Fortnite style that Epic is very precious with and they want to preserve. So with that regard, there is a boundary that we're trying to maintain uh, and a limitation that we're trying to uphold uh, to keep Fortnite looking like Fortnite. Uh, not to say that they're not trying to evolve it, but it's, there is very specific, um, it's a very specific style. However, on the other end of the coin, on the opposite side of the coin, you have someone like Tim Sweeney, the, uh, the owner of Epic. He is a visionary. He has a very clear vision of where he wants to go. And Fortnite is a stepping stone towards that. I believe he's talked about this in, in recent conversations in the past year, where uh, we are trying to create something called the metaverse, you know, the, the next step in what, what the internet could be. Uh, and you 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 read about it in science fiction like Reddit Player One and stuff like that, uh, but to have someone at the helm of a company that that has the resources and the talent and the technology to do that is really exciting. Um, even though I'm not personally involved with that endeavor, uh, it's really exciting to be part of a company that is uh, because we all win when we uh, when we break through that that ceiling into something new and something different. Uh, and that's what I've really enjoyed about Epic is, is it feels very much like a family in terms of the company, more so than I've felt it pretty much anywhere else I've worked. And that's a testament to the culture of, of Epic and how they've been able to uh, grow that culture and maintain that culture uh, with the people that work, work there. Amazing. And so what do you think makes Fortnite so wildly successful? What do you think makes it like the most playable game like all times they say? I I don't know. That's like asking, you know, what is the meaning of life? It, yeah, it just I know. Kind of, it was my it, next question. <laughs> yeah, so I understand that Fortnite existed several years before it became big. And once they introduced the Battle Royale 
format. That's when it exploded two or three years ago. And I think it's just that it's the, uh, you know, most games have a format. They have a story, they have a structure. Uh, and there's things you have to do. There's so many different things you have to do in games these days. It gets kind of overwhelming. Whereas with the Battle Royale format in Fortnite, very simple. You drop into a map, last person standing wins. And it's that simplicity and that direct into action uh, that I think satisfies a lot of people. For me, I've ever since I joined Epic, obviously, I started playing Fortnite. And obviously, I got super hooked, and I still am. Uh, but what I love about Fortnite, personally, for me, is it reminds me of the games I used to play when I was a kid. Like, my favorite game as a middle school teenager was GoldenEye on the N64. That was, like, my all-time favorite game. And when I started playing Fortnite, I was like, wow, this feels a lot like GoldenEye. You're just basically running around, firing at people, and last person standing or whatever wins. And it's that simplicity that I think is married with this... Um, with this ability that Epic has to keep itself relevant in terms of the content they produce and the content they release, uh, that just has this perfect Goldilocks blend of what people enjoy in terms of gaming entertainment. Do you think there is an end to Fortnite? Do you think at some point they'll be like, they'll stop uh, making changes no. to it? No, 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 because it's, it's evolving. We're always evolving it. So, Really, I think the only end that could come to Fortnite is if everybody decides to stop playing it, to be honest. Um, and Epic Pretty spends hard. a great deal of time um, engaging players and making sure that they stay relevant and people stay engaged and interested. So that's, and that's really cool to be a part of. You know, in film, you do get a large audience uh, in certain films that I've worked on, but it pales in comparison to the audience that Fortnite receives. Uh, it, it's it's almost unfathomable how many people play Fortnite at a given moment and how many people uh, have Fortnite uh, in general. It's just, it's pretty crazy. Right. Interesting. And now like looking at the gaming industry as a whole, you mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, uh, maybe five years ago, um, having a texture artist separately um, in a video game company was something not uh, realistic. Um, yeah. So what has changed? Is it about the industry as a whole? I think it's that conver convergence I was speaking about before yes. where you have technology technologies merging between film and gaming. So The Mandalorian is a great example of where Epic's technology with the Unreal Engine has helped filmmakers in the visual effects world uh, realize their vision faster and at qualities that, that rival what they currently do in real time. So with that, you're naturally going to get a, a convergence of methodologies. Uh, and with methodologies, you get disciplines within those method methodologies. So with the gaming industry, and Epic is an example where they're, they're constantly trying to evolve and make things better. Uh, I think they've, they realize that there's a merit and there's a value to having dedicated artists within a department. Uh, because in my experience, it's very difficult to find someone who's a rock star in modeling, texturing, and look development. Uh, they, they exist. There's plenty of them out there, but it's uh, an exception to the rule. More often than not, you're going to find someone who's a rock star at one, pretty good at a second one, and so-so at a third. So if you can find three people that are rock stars at all three, you ultimately get that work done faster and better. Whereas if you have one person doing it and they're a rock star modeler, but the textures are passable, they're, they're good, but they're not great. And the look development's good, but not great, or vice versa. You know, you're gonna get a, a different level of quality. Um, but to the testament of the gaming industry, at least the Epic that I've experienced, there are far more people that are exceptional at all three of those things than I would have found in film. Um, but also that's a testament to Epic finding and attracting really good talent. And everybody at Epic is on their A game and, and everything's passed off better than what it was, which is always uh, fulfilling and enjoyable to see because often in film, it's, it's not always the case. Um, so that, that's been really interesting. So lastly, uh, I'm really interested, how do you, uh, how do you tackle the very, very common 
uh, question from, from juniors. Uh, do I become a 3D generalist or do I um, like double down on one of the aspects? Like just uh, knowing what you've just said about yeah, yeah. A players that do that get everything done and all problems sorted or the majority that try to, but not really. So a few years ago, my answer would have been different. I would have been more inclined to say, be an expert in one thing, proficient in the second, and knowledgeable in the third. Uh, now, it's evolved. I think that if I were to have students now, I would be much more adamant on making sure that they're expert in two things and proficient in the third. Because the talent base and the work that's being produced from junior artists and kids in school is far beyond anything that I've seen or thought could be possible for students. So the competition is that much harder. So uh, these days, it really also comes down to what you want to do. So if someone, if someone has a, a, a small attention span where they get bored with doing the same thing over and over again, so for me, I could, personally, I can eat the same food every single day for the rest of my life. I don't really care. I could listen to the same song and repeat for an entire day. It doesn't bother me. So for me, I'm okay doing one thing all the time. Whereas some people, they can't survive that way. They can't do that. They need to have variety. And so those type of people, for their own sanity and their own happiness, I would recommend maybe you should go into a generalist role. Uh, because the first question I ask is, can you, would you be okay modeling 40 hours a week, you know, 52 weeks yeah. a year? Would you be okay with that? Very quickly, people will say, uh, I don't know, or yes, absolutely, that's all I want to do. And so it's very seldom you get an answer where people aren't sure. Uh, when, you, when I ask a question like that, they're very decisive. And that's when I know, okay, you should definitely be a generalist. However, there's a caveat with being a generalist. Typically, generalists go into environment work. So if you want to be a generalist, but you also want to do characters and creatures, there's a very small niche in visual effects that you can do that then I would lean them towards games because there's a much bigger market to do that as a character artist in games. So it's really going to come down to each individual person and asking themselves, what do I think about every day? What do I pursue every day? And that the answer to that question, and they have to be honest with themselves, will facilitate the steps towards where they should go. All right, cool. This is really insightful. I think, you know, like we've, we've tackled so much as we're actually like uh, uh, running out of time. I'm going to yep. jump to our last exercise here. We have uh, like a little tradition of, uh, of running each guest through like 10 simple questions and you have uh, a few words to answer them. So, okay. you know, like uh, uh, let's try to keep this concise and uh, there are just 10 questions. So, you know, it's going to be okay. If, even if it's painful. <laughs> no, 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 shouldn't be. Um, ready? Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, so what's your favorite place in the world? Uh, favorite place in the world is with my family. Awesome. What are you listening to while you're working? Currently the news. <laughs> That's really it. Love that. Um, What's your favorite way to gain inspiration? Uh, art station. And what's your big life goal? My life goal? Oh. Uh, be a good father, be a good partner, and a good uh, friend. Awesome. Uh, favorite drink? Uh, this is a shameless plug. <laughs> That's my favorite drink. Amazing. Um, first thing you do in the morning. First thing I do. Uh, I kiss my son. Um, what's your backup career? If I had to do something, it would yes. be being a tattoo artist. Awesome. I was going to say love the love the tats. I feel like <laughs> show off <laughs> from different sides. Okay. Um, so what's your recent favorite movie the joker definitely yeah, top 10 that film, that film was quite remarkable yeah and who are some of your legends some people that inspire you somebody you follow 
uh, Carlos Fuente is someone that constantly uh, just I draw so much inspiration from. Uh, also, Gio Knockville, a friend of mine. Um, the the their the artwork that they do is just it's the reason why I pursue harder than I do is because people like that. Cool. And uh, is there anything on your bucket list? Bucket list. Uh, it was to work at Epic and on Fortnite. Um, uh, honestly, I don't really have a bucket list. I, I kind of force gump my way through life, I feel. I kind of just go where I feel like I want to go and, and it seemed to have worked out. I follow my instincts quite a bit. Uh, so I don't really have a grand plan. Uh, I just, I, I listen to my intuition and, and just follow where I, where I feel like I need to be. And that's always worked out quite well. Love that. Thank you so much. That's it. I hope that was yeah, not thank too you. painful. Huh? No, that was great. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Then uh, thank you so much again for coming in the show. I'm going to stop the recording and uh, I'm going to put the links uh, to your contact information yes. and the website in the show notes. So it's just going to be right there. Sounds good. All right. Cheers. All right. I hope you guys learned a thing or two from Justin because I definitely did. In fact, I think that was one of the most content rich episodes and a lot of industry insights. So if you enjoyed the show, as always, give us a like. I would really, really appreciate that. And feel free to leave any comments. We'll make sure that we get them replied and to get notifications about the next episodes of Art Heroes podcast, press this little bell next to subscribe button and then it will enable weekly notifications and we'll make sure that we'll see you next Thursday as always. Cheers and thanks for listening. Ciao. Thanks for listening to Art Heroes Podcast. Check out www.artheroes.co for show notes, more interviews, and free tools made for you by our team of mentors. Tune in next week for more inspiration and keep up the great work, hero.